Welcome to Season 3, Craig. I hope you had a good hiatus. I did. Unfortunately, the year is starting off on a very sad note. We have just learned, as I'm sure all of you know, that uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman has recently died, uh, apparently of a drug overdose. He was only 46 years old, and it is a tragic blow to anyone of his friends and family, and also anyone who loves movies. Yes. Everyone seems legitimately upset, and... Well, it's the, such a shock. Yeah, and, and also, like, the, the loss of potentially 30 more years of astounding performances. It makes me think about actors in the pre-cinema era. Edmund Keane. Edmund Keane, yes. exactly. And they die, and their work is just gone. No one will ever see it. Fortunately for us and for posterity, uh, you know, he leaves behind this legacy of legendary performances that can be watched forever. We must put aside our heavy hearts and instead look forward with enthusiasm to all of the cinema that we get to experience this year and the great season that we have planned for you here in the basement. So goodbye, Philip. The sadness of your passing is only matched by the sadness of a future full of movies that you're not in. What was that? I don't know. <laughs> it's just, your grief takes strange forms. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Valentine's Day is just around the corner. It and is. you and I have a little Valentine's Day tradition that we do here on the show. We watch a doomed, tragic romance <laughs> together. <laughs> I didn't realize it... The doomed part was part of the tradition, but I know now. You also know that traditions are made to be broken. So tonight, we're going to lighten things up a little bit, and we're going to watch something that's a little more fun and a little less doomed. And we're going to be traveling to an exotic locale for our little romantic getaway. Where should we go? Someplace warmer, that's for sure. Oh, definitely. It's shit cold here where we are. <laughs> the seaside, a tropical island, or how about... The desert, and a city that's so full of bright lights that it's gonna set your soul, gonna set your soul on fire. You'll wish there were more than 24 hours in the day when you watch Viva Las Vegas! I have never seen an Elvis movie. I don't know that I've ever seen an entire one. Elvis movies are meant to be watched in not their entirety. Yeah, it was at my mom's house. It was, it was, it was, clam bake was on, and <laughs> next thing I knew... I was changing the channel. Speaking of moms, Elvis is my mom's favorite performer. This episode is for you, mom. Isn't that nice of me? That's that's really nice. Am I, am I not a good son? That, yes. I always have to validate him about how good of a, of a son he is. Released in 1964, starring Elvis Presley and one named sex kitten, Anne Margaret. <laughs> I wish you were wearing a bow tie right now. So. <laughs> this film grossed over $9 million at the box office. However, the title track did not fare quite as well on the Billboard charts, peaking at number 29, and the soundtrack EP charted at number 92, the lowest charting release of Elvis's career up to that point. Whoa, that shocks me because the song Viva Las Vegas is in my top three Elvis songs, probably. I just love that thing. The on-screen chemistry between Presley and Anne Margaret was so intense that they began a very public and brief off-screen affair, much to the chagrin of Priscilla Beaulieu, Presley's then-girlfriend. In her memoirs, Anne Margaret referred to Elvis as her soulmate. Oh. Even though in 1964 his film career was stronger than it had ever been, his music career was on the decline. However, there was another scrappy singer-songwriter from the Midwest whose career was in its ascendancy at that time, and who might that be? Bob Dylan. Funny you should mention him. I've got a gift for you. Close your eyes. And open them up. Oh! Whoa! It's a, oh, it's a jigsaw puzzle! Music critics in the early 60s were trying to piece together Dylan's inscrutable lyrics, you can piece together his inscrutable face on your countertop. <laughs> my countertop? I have very little counter space in my apartment. <laughs> you know what I mean. I know what you mean. It's more of a symbolic countertop right, that right. we all have. Now. Countertop of the mind. Yes. Bob Dylan's favorite cover of one of his songs was a version of, was Elvis Presley covering one of his songs. Which one? I'm afraid I don't recall. That's oh. all right, Mama. I'm only bleeding. <laughs> You can come along for the ride with us as we 
fly on a jet plane over to the uh, windswept, dry heat of the old leather couch to watch Viva Las Vegas. Right like said, it gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on fire. Viva Las Vegas. The Flaming O, the strange name for a hotel. Lucky Jackson is in Las Vegas for the big Grand Prix race. Oh, he's so dreamy. People don't even notice him in Vegas. That's how focused they are on gambling. That's Elvis Presley! He's right next to you! <laughs> he's got a beautiful little car, but the problem is, he ain't got no engine. His rival, Count Mancini, the exotic foreign man, is trying to get Lucky to be his driver in the race. But Lucky says, no way, man. I don't work for anybody. Besides, Lucky just won a big bankroll at the craps tables, and he's going to buy a new motor for his hot rod. He's going to enter the race. They decide right away to become friendly rifles. I'd like to see what you've got under here. Oh, be my guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Margaret. But these two fellas are interrupted by a sexy redhead named Rusty Martin, who's having engine problems. Can you help me, please? Can we help you? Yes, well. Okay. This is not the proper way to talk to Anne Margaret. The proper way to talk to Anne Margaret is. Bah, gah, 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 gah. I would like to hum a mama. -ma. Can I please hum a mama? -ma? Well, is it serious? I'll tell you one thing. The only thing that'll fix this car is kissing. The Count, though, more of a gentleman, fixes it and sends her on her way. Lucky's like, what do you do that? I didn't even get her name, let alone her number. What do you know? She's a swimming instructor at the hotel that Lucky and the Count are staying at. Aha! In today's Hollywood, Anne Margaret's obesity would not be tolerated. <laughs> not at all. Lucky tries to impress Rusty with some guitar playing and singing. That's a really anatomical bottom she has. <laughs> Doesn't leave much to the imagination. It leaves nothing to the imagination. I can count pubic hairs through her shorts. <laughs> it's the swinging 60s, man. I guess so. She loves, loves, loves me. Would you like to make a bet? Uh, you're, you're all wet. Something about all wet. The gentleman. Uh, wet. Nailed it! Well done. He loses his money at the bottom of the pool. Can't buy the engine. He can't pay for the hotel. And he has to become a waiter at the hotel to pay his bill. But Rusty goes on a date with him anyway. How would you like to go out with me? And how would you like to pay for it? <laughs> but first, you gotta prove yourself to me by dancing. Meet me at the college where I go to school because I'm a smart girl. He meets her at 9 a.m. the next day. She's working on this very exuberant routine of, of the dancing. If you don't want to dance, sing. Come on, everybody, and clap your hands real loud. Come on, everybody, take a real deep breath and repeat after me. I love my baby. I love my baby. I love my baby. Hey, hey, hey. hey. I like it when Elvis tells us what to do. I know. I make it so I don't have to think. Come on, everybody, and whistle this tune right now. Come on, everybody, and stomp your feet real loud. Come on, everybody, take a real deep breath and repeat after me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think something went wrong there. They hit all the sites in Las Vegas. An epic date involving about 12 different costume changes. Lucky even knows how to fly a helicopter. Then we get to learn a little something about Hoover Dam. Do you know that it's over 700 feet from the Colorado River below to the top of the dam? Oh wait, we should be taking notes on this. <laughs> Lucky gets to meet old man Martin and he's a hoot. I like to hear what you have to say about race driving. And race riots. <laughs> hey mama, don't you treat me wrong. Come and love your daddy all night long. I just had an orgasm. <laughs> I just had an orgasm. <laughs> they seem to be falling in love, these two. But Rusty wants him to quit racing because race car drivers can end up dead. So she leaves him behind. And immediately, she starts dating the Count, who's also a race car driver. Rusty. Oh, hi. Hi, Rusty. Hi. 
Oh, oh hi, Rusty. <laughs> but Lucky shows up in his waiter costume. He's a bad waiter all over the place. And he messes up the date. But that doesn't matter, because it's time for the big talent contest. Rusty does a, a sultry song about being appreciated. She gets a 10 on the applause meter. How is she gonna, how's that, how is anyone gonna beat that? But Lucky comes out and he does a little song called Las Vegas with the and the Wombats are crashing? <laughs> and he gets a 10 from the audience too. Well, they have to flip a coin to see who the winner is. And Lucky wins. But he doesn't win any cash. He wins a bogus trophy and a stupid envelope full of a bunch of bullcrap. And Rusty wins a pool table. So Lucky's not going to be able to buy his motor, and he's sad. Bam! <laughs> Shorty gets an idea, and he runs off. The race starts at midnight. At the last minute, Shorty shows up. He's got the motor. Somehow he bought it. Rusty's not too happy about any of this, and she goes home and has an angry lunch-making session. She makes very angry sandwiches, and she comes back to the garage with enough food to feed her father for weeks. She kind of messes everything up because she's a girl. They get the car finished just in time for the big race. Come on, let's push it. Come on, let's push it. Push it real good. Here comes Lucky Jackson now. This is a real uh, thriller. We didn't think you'd make the grid at all from the reports we've been getting all There was a woman who showed up and uh, with a very elaborate lunch. <laughs> There are messages written in the sandwiches. The race begins, and they zip off through the Vegas streets and out into the desert. <laughs> My glasses are sweating. <laughs> There's lots of driving and zooming around, shifting. The race is, they're racing around. Shorty and the dad and Rusty are following in a helicopter. There's something wrong with the Count's car. He has a flat tire. Lucky tries to signal to him, but it's too late. The Count wipes out and he is killed, undoubtedly. He's, a uh, car smashes into him. Oh my God! We presume he's dead or will not be able to move for the rest of his life. He is dead. Lucky just shrugs it off, he doesn't care. That's racing, baby. More drivers meet their fiery doom. <laughs> ah! <laughs> ah! There's a whole lot of dead motorists in the Nevada desert. But as the flag, what, I don't, I don't know race words. Lucky wins the race. Mancini's dead, I don't give a shit. <laughs> right, partner, take good care. Right. Seriously, he died, his he, friend died. We just gotta stare at Aunt Margaret's hoochie again. <laughs> no kind of rapping up loose ends, none of that. Viva Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. Viva, Viva, Viva Las Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> Not much of a movie, I'm just gonna say. I'm just gonna come out and say it right now. It functioned as a movie. There were scenes and a plot, people acting and such. Quality of it? Not so good. <laughs> I don't want to get down on Elvis or nothing, but yeah, it is, his movie here wasn't all that compelling. Well, let's talk about Elvis for a second. What are the merits of Elvis as a movie star. You can look at him. Easy to look at him. Good looking. Mm -hmm. Great voice. Yep. Dancer. Not a great dancer. He's an okay That's dancer. That's what I... He's, he's okay. got a sense of rhythm, but when he starts doing stuff with his arms, mm -hmm. he looks he look, looks kind of like Frankenstein. You see him performing on stage, like old old performances of it. He's just moving naturally the, to the music. It's the sexuality. Yeah. And it's the rhythm of the beat. When you give him choreography, he seems like very limited range. Then. Yeah. Charm is a big mm -hmm. asset of Mr. Presley, although I imagine that was a diminishing return as the years went on <laughs> yes. and as he got sick of doing these stupid movies. Mm -hmm. We did talk a little bit about how abruptly the movie ended yeah. and how it seemed like they just ran out of money and had to end it, but this movie actually did go way over budget. Oh, did it? And so that might have been an actual concern, <laughs> like they couldn't <laughs> shoot those final scenes where he attends the Count's funeral. <laughs> And says goodbye to his friend at the at the closed casket. Very, very closed casket. <laughs> they wouldn't let the coroner see the body. That's right. They buried him in a plastic bag. <laughs> that was a gruesome car wreck. We're going to get into hard realism here. There's death, but the fact that it's never acknowledged, mm -hmm. it's never talked about, somehow makes it worse. Yeah, even if it was just Anne Margaret screaming in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> 
I knew that guy. I dated that corpse. <laughs> How does this movie function as a romance? How well does it do? Like, oh yeah, check it out. Beautiful people meeting each other and falling for each other. Who else are they going to go for? Okay, so yeah. that's that's the appeal of it. It's just that these no, two. I'm not these saying two... it's appealing. I'm just saying that's what happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think it's a strong romance. I don't think it's a strong musical. But we've been getting down on this movie quite a bit. Uh, what were some of the good things about it? There had to be something. I liked William Demarest hitting his head on the hood of the car. Oh, that was funny. Yeah. That is a comic actor right there. Uh, Anne Margaret's uh, first like dance number was like very intriguing with her little weird popping motions that she'd do. Sure, she was popping and locking. <laughs> One great bit of editing, when he raises up his hand and he cuts to Shorty back at the garage oh, with yeah, his own yeah. hand up. Oh, wow, that's like 2001. <laughs> but Oh, Stanley Kubrick's Viva Las Vegas. If only we could visit that parallel universe where that exists. This movie was like a piece of kind of crappy candy. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a bit of honey. All right, well, we're done shaking and shimmying and dancing around and watching Viva Las Vegas. It was, it was okay, but you should check it out. It is a fun movie. It's got Elvis, for God's sake. Yeah, and El Margaret. Elvis and Margaret, you could do a lot worse. Well, if you are unable to take a trip to Las Vegas, at least you can take a trip to WelcomeToTheBasementShow.com, our website. There's plenty for you to see and do. There's no gambling yet, but we're working on it. Not really. Anyway, our show is there, and our PayPal donation button is there. Last year, we had so many great donors who supported the show with uh, their various fortunes. And you can, too. It only takes a dollar or two. You can help us out bringing you this show as we do month after month, year after year. <laughs> Just kidding. Our recent donors are as follows. Laurent, or Laurent who says, I'm a great fan of this show since the first episode. You are a great fan. Zoe, who writes, I asked my mom to give you my allowance for this week. I have been sick with mono for the past week, and your videos have been making me laugh. Oh, that's very sweet, Zoe. We hope you get well soon. Rest Good. up, lots of fluids. Yep. Chris, Oliver, Jonathan, McGill, Robert, and Karen, who writes, From Karen, Tony, Norman, and Butter, thanks for such a wonderful show. We look forward to every episode. Thanks, guys. Butter is a dog. Norman is a cat. I know this because I know things. He's right. And now it's time for seeing it, baby. Seen it! A nice popping and locking. <laughs> this is our first seen it of the new year, and as promised, the first movie we're going to discuss is a movie that I challenged you to watch for the new year, and you did it. Uh, yes, I did. From Dan Vede Boncour, he writes, Suggestion for next season, The Deer Hunter. Seen it. Seen it. Finally, after all these years. After all these years. I don't know why I didn't see it before. I don't think I've ever seen a movie that felt so textured. It all felt so real. I never felt like I could smell a movie like I could this one. The wedding sequence is so real in the movie. It's like you're actually there. It's as long as a real wedding. Yes, it is. You see an entire <laughs> Rutherian Catholic wedding. I think I went into the movie with bad expectations. I expected a three-hour Vietnam movie, mm -hmm. not a three-hour movie with 45 minutes in Vietnam. Yeah. I really wanted them to get to Vietnam and yeah. start shooting at their heads with guns. Yeah. Get him out! I really feel like I should revisit the film uh, sometime, but honestly, I don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah. Vanessa Smith writes, Amadeus. A childhood favorite of mine, it continues to be so for the brilliant acting and gorgeous locations, sets, and costumes. Not to mention being a fan of Mozart's music, which is a character in itself in the film. Seen it. Ha 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 ha! Seen it. That's one of the few movies of my lifetime that I think won Best Picture that deserved to win Best Picture. It functions on two different levels. It's a really detailed and well thought out biopic, but it also takes an important philosophical stance about. Uh, artistic endeavors and you know true inspiration versus mediocrity yeah and that's something i think i've carried with me my whole life and, you know when, when embarking on creative projects just you don't always need to do what the masses find appealing you know you always want to strike out on your own path and that's what's going to be the most satisfying and ultimately what's going to yield the best um result yeah Tony DeFrancisco writes, Rounders. Movies about addiction and organized crime are a dime a dozen, but usually the protagonist undergoes some sort of moral improvement throughout the movie. Does everyone's favorite Damon, Matt Damon, really grow throughout his journey, or does he end up just as screwed up as before? Plus John Malkovich delivering fantastic one-liners in a Russian accent. 
Uh, seen it. Seen it. I don't know the answer to your question. I think you've uh, thought about this movie quite a bit. The one thing I want to say is uh, John Malkovich, supposed to be this badass world champion card player, has the most obvious tell in the history of poker. Oh, yes. Every yes, time, he does. <laughs> Every time he gets a great hand, he picks up a cookie and he twists it open and he licks it. <laughs> And somehow people don't know that yeah. he's got a great hand. No, 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 that one. Ah, hmm. Ah, but Malcolm got to love him. I love that yeah. guy. It's it's a it's a good movie, but it's got some kind of ridiculous things like that yeah. throughout. Caroline Whitland. I'm sure you've likely seen it, but my friends and I love watching Labyrinth when we're in need of a good laugh. It's the worst, best movie I've ever seen. Seen it. Seen it. I like Labyrinth. I, I do like Labyrinth. I didn't see it until just last year. When my nephew Ryan was growing up, he was obsessed with Labyrinth. I've seen that movie, like, uh, at least a dozen times. <laughs> at a very early age, my nephew and I got to bond over cinema. I think it's a very important movie for all young women to watch, because it's all about being manipulated by a man. Hmm. That the Goblin King, throughout this entire Labyrinth, making her do all this stuff, and whenever she does something wrong, he's like, that's not what I wanted. You know, and it's like, he's just it's a passive-aggressive manipulation. He's singing this, like, er- almost erotic song to a 12-year-old girl. Those Jim Henson movies got mm-hmm. dangerous back yeah. when he was still alive. Man Met 29. I just wanted to know if you guys have ever seen Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. It's one of my favorite movies. Seen it. Guilty as charged. Seen it. It's a very funny movie, but I didn't want to see it at all because they had horrible ads for the movie. Do you like Cox? Get get cocks in you. Get yeah. cocks in your ear holes. Yeah, yeah. Stupid. Really great writing and really great songs. Let's Duet is a brilliantly written song that would work in any musical and be hysterical. I mean, as far as parody movies goes, it's, it's right at the top. So, that's Seen It. And that's our show. We hope you had a good time celebrating Valentine's Day with your sweetie or with your single friends complaining about Valentine's Day. Or alone, reflecting on the world and your place in it. I've had a good time on our date tonight, but you know what? I think that there's something missing. What's that, Matt? I miss our tradition of watching a doomed, tragic romance. But you know what? February is not over yet. And so our next episode, we are going to watch something that is romantic and tragic and doomed. See you then. That movie just ended. Yeah, you got to see a little bit of death. And they got married. I to see a lot of death. Yeah. More death than I wanted to see watching this movie. <laughs> well, he had just gotten out of the army. Right. Yeah. S- spraying napalm on North Vietnamese. And, well, he, he was in Germany. Spraying napalm on Nazis. What's the difference? People on the